Congratulations. Thank, Thank you very much. For talking to Sky News. There is still anger amongst some of your colleagues about the events of last week, and some of that is being directed at your Treasurer and your Deputy. Uh, to clear the air on this, can you tell us when did you finally decide to challenge Tony Abbott and when did you tell Julie Bishop and Scott Morrison? Well, I've I didn't say any, I, I've made a practice of not talking about leadership issues before I was the leader and I'm not going to talk about them after I've become the leader. So the, the decision to challenge was entirely mine, uh, but I, I really, I don't want to get, get into a debate about the archaeology or the history or the connections and but so uh, forth. As you know, there's, there's still suspicion around it. I mean, it's no trivial thing changing mm. prime ministers. No, it is, no, it's a very serious thing. But don't people deserve and, to know what happened? Well, the the, the, it's, a very, it's a very simple matter that I, I, came, I came in to see Tony, I told him I was going to challenge him, I told him why I was going to challenge him, mm. I left his office, I spoke briefly to the media and explained that I was, why I was challenging him, and then the party had a ballot. I mean, the, the leader... Before, when, when you made the decision and when those two key figures knew about it? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to... Uh, go into those in, in, into, into the history of it. I don't think there is any purpose to be served for the government or the party by my doing so. I've always been very circumspect about issues of leadership, and I that's for many years, as you know, much to the disappointment of sure, what, distinguished what, journalists like yourself. What do you say to uh, settle down those who are still upset? I mean, should they back off uh, in terms of Scott Morrison and Julie Bishop? Well, I, what, I, what I would say is that we've, we have got to work together as a team. Uh, there are times when tough decisions have to be taken about leadership. I know all about that. I was, I was uh, removed as leader by the party uh, some years ago in, in 2009. So I've, you know, I've been on the receiving end. Uh, the leader of the Liberal Party serves at the pleasure of the party room, full stop. That's, that's what it's all about. It is up to the party room to make that decision. Uh, no one's entitled to be leader. Uh, it is entirely a function of the wishes of the party room. And they've, once they've made their decision, then, because politics is a team business, all of us should get together behind the leader, just as everyone did got behind uh, Tony back in 2009. Let me ask you about, uh, well, one of the leadership decisions you've taken. You're dropping Peter Dutton from the National Security Committee of Cabinet. Uh, immigration ministers for quite a while now have sat on that committee. Why? Well, the, the, uh, during the Howard uh, government, which I regard in terms of cabinet process as absolutely the gold standard, <coughs> and you know, while this is a very modern 21st century government, and, and obviously I'm not John Howard. Uh, nonetheless, John was uh, an outstanding Prime Minister. He ran a very, very solid, traditional, business-like cabinet government, and that is something I'm determined to go to restore. That's why Arthur Sinodinus is the cabinet secretary. We are very focused on that. Now, under the uh, Howard government, the immigration minister was for most of that time, not a permanent member of the National Security Committee. Amanda Vanstone was, wasn't she? Well, at, 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 for, for periods, but just let me be quite clear about this. Um, ministers have got to get on with their jobs, get on with their day jobs. Um, you, clearly, you clearly want to ensure that no minister is in a committee uh, taking up his or her very valuable time uh, on matters that are not directly relevant to them. So, we so now have border force, which is uh, you know meant to be equivalent of, of, of the AFP. We have a lot of border control issues uh, when it comes to the well, threat do, of terrorism. When those issues come up. The immigration minister, as has always been the case, will be seconded. I mean, when I was the communications minister, when issues relating to telecommunication security or cyber security came up, I was often uh, brought into the NSC. I mean, it is, this is not a you know, the, 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 we're talking about, you're talking about form, I'm talking about function. What We've got to have an efficient government where people's time is used efficiently. Uh, this is not an issue of status. This is, a, we have a national security committee that is, as, that is very close to the arrangements that worked so well during John Howard's time as Let Prime Minister. You, uh, and by the way, by the way, uh, if they, if, um, you know, experience suggests that we should change the arrangements. We will. N none of this is being written in stone. But I'd rather off. St I'd rather start off with the NSC being 
leaner uh, to begin with, and if we have to, if if we have to change the permanent membership, we can do so. You know, this is not. Um, you've got to understand this is a modern 20th century agile government and we will adapt all of our arrangements as circumstances require to meet the situation. All right, let me ask you uh, another question on immigration and this may go to some adapting as circumstances mm -hmm. present. We do have a bipartisan settlement on border protection policies now yeah. but we still have uh, hundreds, more than hundreds, stuck on Manus Island and Nauru. Uh, many of them have been there for two years now. Many of them have been processed, found to be refugees but they're not being resettled. None have been resettled in, uh, in PNG. In Nauru, a little baby was born for the first time in detention this week, mm -hmm. a little girl who has no citizenship. Will you rule out ever taking any of these people here? Well, for a start, I, I have definitely rule out uh, answering uh, rule in, rule out questions from journalists, so I'm so not... you don't rule that? No, no. <laughs> Gosh, no. What I'm saying to you is, what I'm saying to you is that all of our policies, our existing policies, are on foot. Uh, when we uh, no, all right. in this situation, you've, you've got people really stuck, and, and and neither major party is talking about it. What to do with them? Well, look, I I I, un I, I understand the issue. I I have the same concerns about it, about the situation of people in Manus and Nauru as you do, and as 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 I would think almost all Australia all Australians do, as, as the minister, Mr. Dutton, does. Uh, yeah, but, but exactly. But uh, what I'm not going to do is make changes to our border protection policy. Sitting here with you, uh, our, our policies will change. All policies change. Uh, but when we do make changes, we'll do so in a considered way, and they will be made by the ministers, the minister, myself, the cabinet. It is a. Well, what I'm there asking is, is, is this an area that needs to be changed? Well, this is this. This is an area that clearly is one that is uh, controversial, that is a challenging one. It's certainly uh, one that close attention is being paid to. But what I'm not going to do is, is uh, announce changes or foreshadow changes uh, sitting here with you, much and all as, as I can understand your interest. And, I, and, I, and look, I, can I be very frank with you? I thank you for raising it it's legitimate to raise it. It's good that you raise it, but you've got to understand that this is a cabinet government and we are not going to make, not me nor any minister, we are not going to make policy changes, particularly of the type you're talking about, on the run. We're going to, we, we will be, the, all of these matters will be considered uh, and in the event that policy changes, then we will make an appropriate announcement. I want to turn to the, the economy, and, and again, this gets to, I suppose, at least the priorities you're going to bring as, as Prime Minister to these, these things. You did say uh, in mounting your case for the leadership change, the quote, <coughs> the government is not successful in providing the economic leadership we need. When are we going to see when? I mean, I'm just asking about the timing here. Your alternative plans for the economy. Well, we were certainly determined to provide better or greater leadership, stronger leadership, more confident leadership, that's probably the best, the better term, more confident leadership uh, on the economy. Of course, of course there will be new policies and we are certainly looking at policies that will promote innovation, that will promote productivity, that will provide greater incentives to work. Uh, you know, all of those, and there are a lot of levers and it is very complex. Uh, they're absolutely very key priorities, but you know something? Uh, we've already seen, and this is, the, this is the power of confident, positive leadership, we've already seen a significant rise in business confidence. Now, you know what that means? That means businesses are investing. They're hiring. People are getting jobs. They're making more money. They're paying more tax than they otherwise would. Business confidence has been a critical issue. If you listen to Glenn Stevens, the Reserve Bank Governor, he has been saying this for a very long time that here we are in a world where interest rates are as low as they've ever been, uh, and yet we don't have enough business confidence to promote investment. Well, he also now, we have already seen a rise in business confidence because we have a, a government that is talking confidently about our future and is in, talking optimistically about our future and indicating 
if not the precise policies, because I've only been Prime Minister for a week, but the outcomes we seek to achieve. And it's important that people understand where we want to get to, uh, and then, of course, we will design the policies that we hope will take us on that journey. Glenn Stevens has also been talking about the need for labour market reform for a while. I mean, one of the bits of low-hanging fruit, I suppose, is Sunday penalty rates. Mm -hmm. What's your view on that? Should they stay? Well, again, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry not to be able to uh, announce all of our policies on your program, but we are, all of these matters are under consideration. Right? Right. But, but it, is, it is very important that we proceed in an orderly way. And what's see, the timing then of that orderly way? Uh, are we going to see a mini budget any time soon? Are you going to wait till next year's budget or are you going to actually wait until after the next election? Well, I, I, I'm, I don't believe in rushing things in a sort of hasty or considered way, but equally I believe you can make uh, well considered decisions quickly. Uh, so I, I, I believe, and you, you saw the way that I changed the, uh, the uh, strategy and direction of the NBN. That was done quickly, but it was done in a very, very well-considered, well-argued way, and that is certainly the way I intend to proceed as Prime Minister. But so, so will we see change this year in terms of economic policy? Well, I'm not going to put a time frame on it. On it. <laughs> what you will see is the government proceeding to uh, deliver on an economic reform agenda that will promote productivity, will promote innovation, uh, will continue to promote business confidence and investment, and will do so in an, in an orderly way, and will do it as, as quickly as we can. I don't believe in spinning my wheels. Is the next election still 10 or 11 months away, as you said last that, week? That is certainly what, okay. that's certainly what I'm assuming, and, and you know, unless you have a better idea of what's going to happen, you should, assume, suggest, well, you should assume Sounds that. like a good plan. I, uh, that's any, definitely the plan. Any plans for Senate voting reform before then? Well, th there, are, there are no, we have no specific plans. It's obviously an issue that uh, people have talked about. I enjoy a very good working relationship with the Senate crossbenchers. Uh, and I also have, have reached out to the leader of the Greens, uh, Richard Di Natale. Uh, so we, we want to have a good relationship. Some of them were voted, though, on, I mean, Ricky Muir, on 0.5, half a percent of, it was his primary vote. Does that concern you at all? Well, I, I, und I certainly understand the, the, uh, the concerns about it and the, the, you know, the, the, the issues about transparency. But the, the simple fact of the matter is Senator Muir is a senator. He is, he's, he is as democratically and constitutionally elected to this uh, point. Does place that as, that, as that I system. am as the member for Wentworth. And certainly there are many uh, considerations about changing the Senate voting rules. But the, the fact is we do not have a specific proposal, and we, but we are talking about it with all the other parties. Uh, the China Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. have you read it? The tri I've, I've certainly read summaries of it, and I've read elements of it, and I've discussed it at length with Andrew Robb, but I know I haven't read well, the, the, the whole bit that pile of uh, uh, documents. The but bit that Labor's concerned about is the mm. Chapter 10 um, part of it, where it says Labor market testing won't apply to a range of different groups, including uh, people with <coughs> trade, technical <coughs> or professional skills. Mm. Why shouldn't tradies be worried about that? Well, the, the Labor really should have to answer why it is that exactly the same arrangements are in the Chile Free Trade Agreement. I mean, this is not... They are really singling uh, China out. Now... There are some differences, no, though. No, well, there are... David, there are, there are some differences, but not material to the point you're raising. Now, let, let me just be clear about the China Free Trade Agreement. This is an agreement that opens up to all Australian businesses the world's largest single economy. It is an absolutely fundamental building block for our prosperity. It has the support of every Labor Premier. It has the support of past Labor leaders, like Bob Hawke, like Simon Crean, like Bob Carr. It has the overwhelming endorsement of the business community. Now, what's happened is that Bill Shorten has never proposed any specific changes he has been dragged along in the slipstream of the CFMEU, Labor which, has run, which has run an alarmist, scaremongering campaign, millions of dollars designed to frighten people back into poverty. Not and, disputing and that, but Labor, Labor is suggesting safeguard legislation to, to ensure mm. that for those low-skill 457 category visas, uh, local jobs, uh, jobs are off to locals first. 
in the interest of getting this whole thing done quickly, why not sit down and talk about that? Well, we're obviously open to, to uh, talking to them, but uh, the, they have made no specific proposals. Now, there is legislation in the House. They could move an amendment. They could propose a substantial change or variation to Mr Robb. I mean, Andrew is there. He is, he's the architect of this deal. He, he knows every single... Um, you know, comma and semicolon through the whole thing. So you're open to talks pre- anyway? Well, well, of course, well, of course we're, we're always open to talks. But what we've had is, you see, this is... This, look, I, I don't want to be unduly critical of Mr Shorten. I understand his position. The Labor Party is the political wing of the union movement. I understand all that. But his problem is that the CFMEU has run an extreme scaremongering campaign designed to frighten people, which is aggressively anti-Chinese, and really absolutely contrary to our national interest, contrary to jobs. And because he has been silent, everyone assumes the only reasonable assumption is that he endorses it. He is just bobbing along like a cork in the slipstream of the CFMEU. And basically, you've got the CFMEU driving the Labor Party, this is the alternative government, the Labor Party's economic policy. Now, Mr Shorten can sort that out. He can say, look, I don't go along with all that extremist stuff. I've got some specific proposals. He could do that, but he hasn't to date, at any rate, had the courage to do so. And I'd encourage him to focus on that rather, yeah. than, rather than just being a passive, um, sort of a passive uh, cork, as I said, just bobbing okay. along, but, uh, trailed along. You, you, you want deeper trade ties with China, but you have been critical of their foreign policy approach in the South China Sea. Can I just ask, well, what's going to be your first... Um, port of call internationally? Will it be China? Will it be Japan? What's your priority? Well, it, it, it's not, uh, it is, it, it's, it, frankly, it's not settled yet, but it is most likely to be uh, the, the, mo- the, the first sort of substantial uh, international ga- gathering I go to. Was in terms of a multilateral gathering, will certainly be the G20 meeting in um, Turkey, where, of course, I'll be meeting with, with the leaders of, you know, of the 20 largest economies. But the, the program is, uh, is still a, a work in progress. So I know a week is a long time in politics, but it's actually, it's actually not, uh, not that yeah, long a time. Let me finally ask you, yeah. Yeah, you, you are a former journalist and you gave a stirring speech this morning at the mm. War Memorial at mm. the opening of the unveiling of the um, War Correspondents Memorial there. Uh, you, you spoke about the importance of journalists speaking truth to power yes. uh, and, and the need for a free and courageous press. Uh, Peter Grister was there, I know you met him mm. yesterday. Uh, mm. He's a good example of these fine traditions yeah. of journalism. Sure. Will you be pressing the Egyptian president to pardon Peter Grester, who has been convicted of a that, terrorist that is, offence? That, that, is, that is absolutely the government's position, and we, we'll, we, we, have, we will and can continue to encourage the Egyptian president uh, to do that. that is, that's, certainly, that's absolutely our position, just as I said at the War Memorial. And, and you know, uh, I just repeat what I said there, David. The... Um, the work that you do, the work that Peter Grester does, is as important to our democracy as the work that I do. Uh, we, we, you, we cannot have a democracy without a free and inquiring press. That, that, that challenges government and challenges vested interests. So um, when, when we're honouring war correspondents, when we're honouring the work of Peter Grester, for example, we're actually honouring ourselves, our democracy. It, it, is, it is an integral part of our democracy. People sometimes think of the media, because the media doesn't always agree with the government, uh, if you're in government sometimes you'd regret that, but just because the media and journalists don't always agree with the government doesn't mean that they're not absolutely critically important to our democracy. Just like ju- the judiciary, just like the agencies, the security agencies and the defence forces that defend it. It's a very complex beast. You know, we have a most we have one of the most remarkable societies in the world, one of the oldest democracies, and there are a lot of parts to it. It's complex, but right at the very heart of our freedom is a free and courageous press. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, thanks for talking to us. Great.